What is up down and sideways, all you beautiful individuals? Welcome back to another Rappy Up League. I'm Mike Eric and Mark here with you beauties for a little bit of Gen G Part 2. Talking Gen G Orange, a.k.a. Hanwha Life, matching up against T1, who of course they kind of owned in the regular season of the summer split. But we're looking for that T1 playoff buff to come around and coming into this one after all the Nasus Garen madness in the D plus Gen G series. We thought, okay, maybe that's going to come out right away swinging. It didn't. We got a pretty standard draft in game one, except for a little cheeky Vladimir top sighting. Yes, we got a Vladimir top sighting bringing back one of the oldest counters in the game because we get a blind cannon pick on the side of t1 rolling through on the side to uh zeus in the top which yes we've seen him roll the cannon before so not necessarily super crazy and you know he's a playing little... at ad by the way yes which kind of a little bit wonky and certainly uh, a requirement given the other parts of the composition here laid out by t1 including faker's classic leblanc in the mid lane which is where t1 identify and want to get things started early but a little bit of misfire a little bit of miscommunication uh, misplanning whatever it is ends up being a zeka surviving any type of attempts of pressure early game momentum snowball rolling that t1 tried to get going hanwha life was there to answer and not able to and, and be able to hold and not give up too much to t1 t1 ultimately then pays the price, not getting the composition on in time. Meanwhile, the standover, the trade over from yesterday is Ziggs in this one, not the Nasus, not the Corky. It is Ziggs staying in this one in the bottom lane for Viper. And he was picking up a lot, a lot of stacks, getting up a lot of that uh, CS for this Ziggs that was going to be a problem later. Yeah, uh, he basically just farms some turret plates, as is the Zig's way. Farms a whole lot of gold, ends up doing some nutty damage late game. And the Vladimir post landing phase, truthfully, didn't have a huge amount of impact. Didn't really have to with the level uh, that Zekka's Yone was playing. And all of a sudden, melee mid lane starts sneaking back into some lineups. And you're saying, oh my god, is that Worlds 2022 Zekka music? I, I think you could hear it heading into this series. You might believe a couple of people when you look at some of the stats from this uh, back half of the summer split. I think that's something that we do need to recognize was that kind of under the radar between how amazing Chovy has been, obviously the ups and downs and conversation that goes with T1 and then kind of getting distracted maybe with D plus Kia rising up and then the other parts of Hanwha life being what has ultimately moved along the engine. Yone, things like that for Zeka. Yes, he's going to be popping off, and he popped off in this one, making that wombo combo happen. And uh, you mentioned the Vladimir not really getting to do too much. Well, when you have a wombo combo rolling as that Vi and Yone, the only thing you need from that yeah, Vladimir, put down that ultimate. Just lay it down on there, get that extra damage popping off for us, and we are going to be gold. Yeah, the press R comp works to pretty much perfection in that first game for Hanwha Life. Second game of this series is where we get the Doge sighting in the mid lane. Yes, it's Faker on the Nasus, but this time it's not an all melee matchup. It's more just a kind of free lane for the Smolder out of Zeka to pick up stacks and farm freely. I know this Nasus solo lane is the ARAM special. You're maxing the E to poke people out, but it feels a little bit different not matching up opposite gear. Which I I, I wanted to give a, a shout out to LS. I think he was poking some some holes in this one for some people mentioning out that, hey, we were talking about NASA's support last year. Shout out to how Trimby. Broken, shout out to Trimby and mentioning how broken this champion was specifically this ability and that we were seeing it at the forefront. And yes, I still think that is one of the power picks and one of the ones that can be used. You have to be careful on what compositions you're putting it into right now and what's on the enemy side. And that smolder for Zekka is a problem because it's able to pick up a ton of free stacks on this Nasus. Yes, Nasus is trying to stack up. Yes, Nasus can get the big mighty Q to just ultimately squash a smolder at some point. But that smolder is going to be peppering you and laying into you before you eventually get in that distance 
to get that cue off. Baker never able to get any of those opportunities in this game too, really. Never an opportunity for T1 to get something going in this game too. Eventually uh, going bust and running it into the buzzsaw that became Hanwha Life. Well, they're just sprinting it, trying to get to this smolder. And time and time again, it's Zeka just getting spoon-fed kills. He ends up finishing 16-2-2. Two and two. And how about we've seen T1 roll in the three triple AD carry comps. How about the zero zilch ADC comp in this one with the Seraphine Shen bot lane that NASA made, as I mentioned, and then the Olaf top. They could not find any team fights in their favor in this game. And it's, you know, not necessarily the angle again that I would want to see Seraphine come through. I think you did get to see a little bit of the glimpse of what she can offer right now for a team. And, and you know, especially if she can get to some of these power numbers and, and spots where Gumo, at, you know, until things got out of control in this game, was able to provide for T1. You, you see in this composition any of the problems, any of the chances to get towards these carries for Hanwha Life, it was over for T1 in this one. Dunzo. So a 4 0 19 Ziggs performance out of Viper in that second one. We're reliving shades of D plus Genji. The Ziggs make it stop. But T1, they adapt in game three. They don't ban the Ziggs away, but they take it for Guma Yushi to pilot in that bot lane and the smolder goes the way to Faker, and more importantly, it's the Camille versus Jax matchup, and in this third game, all the attention is going to Zeus, and they're shutting down Doran early, and listen, they absolutely do. My man was down 20 CS, and he was level 4 on the Jax to the level 6 out of Camille, but you can't keep down Papa Doran when he sees Zeus on the other side. No, no, you can't. Doran takes over a slumbering beast in this series, certainly making a couple key contributions, make no mistakes in games one and two, but absolutely pops off in this game three. And it starts with a complete whimpering whisper to get off the ground until it is a thundering, roaring applause at the end as Hanwha Life closes up the series three to nothing on T1. You go back, you get a triple kill for this Jax to really start popping off. And that's an important team fight I want to mention because this is one that was primed to be a possibility for T1. If it's a minute or two later would be the situation that would have fit best because then you have Faker on Smolder hitting the same type of damage points, hitting the same type of stack points where Zekka be started to become a major problem in game Two. That didn't get to happen. This smolder doesn't get to absolutely pop off and take over the team fight that it was primed for. And it does end up feeding into that Jax, which was the worst problem for T1. And to count, top it all off, the doo doo rotten cherry Sunday of it all is you go down to the bottom lane and that Ziggs, that priority pick that you have identified on, that you sacrificed stuff like Senna, like an Ivern type of situation here for owner is taking that Ziggs and not fully nurturing it to the proper ways that it needed to be. One of the key differences between Viper and Guma throughout this series, uh, Viper must have thought he's playing the pre-release Riot MMO. He's going around PvE. He's just farming it up. And even when it came time for PvP, bro, he's just throwing it from a screen away, getting those bombs in there. That's all he ever had to do. In any of these team fights, Guma is sweating for his life, getting dived by all these members of Hanwell Life, and there's nothing that T1 can do to provide protection. Yeah, I mean, it's basically five guys that are diving at him from the even the Kaisa for Viper dashing back there. But uh, yeah, the Smolder can never hit the levels that Zeka did. Another immaculate Yone performance out of him. Absolutely him and Peanut are the stars of this series for Hanwha Life because Owner was irrelevant in this series. Peanut was living in his head. He felt like he was two, three, maybe even four steps ahead of him at times. And there were basically no AP junglers picked in this series. You kept Peanut away from the Maokai. You kept him away from the Ivern, the two big tree champions that you don't want him to be playing in the jungle given his exceptional mastery that we have seen and utilization of it for Hanwha Life. 
entering into this series and, and seeing how the past one went for T1, owner had a good showing. This was going to be one of the matchups that we did talk about and we identified that it was either going to be the veteran savvy, the knowledge of Peanut coming through in that execution with Hanwha Life, or it was gonna be something creative on the side of T1. I don't think we saw that really on T1 when you truly go through it or any of it really paying off for the T1 side. And you do get that veteran performance from Peanut. How about that moment? where owner just goes right by him and Peanut says, I'm not looking for you, buddy. Going right on your ADC and he's gonna be out of the game. And that happened many times. Uh, Peanut had some insane Vi engages across this board. Uh, the, the one line for this series is just the team fighting out of Hanwha Life was at another level on the day. The synergy, whether it was a Wombo combo or these extended skirmishes, all five players felt like they were on a string going around absolutely clean. Uh, the T1 side, I mean, obviously there's a lot of guys you can harp on, but we were just highlighting. What was the secret to KT? The Chad Alpha status we were getting out of Guma, engaging on Nyla when the rest of the team's running away. So what do you do? You put him on Ash, Seraphine, and Ziggs in this series? Those are the least alpha champs in the game. And the Ziggs champion picking that game three is a major problem because I think it didn't take any uh, insane analysis on the day to understand that T1 wasn't going to just, oh, that's your toys? Oh, I can, I, let me play with them over here in my sandbox. I know exactly how to how to work the crane on this. No, you don't, bro. You, you These instructions are in a different language for you at this point <laughs> on the day. It was not good from T1 taking that one and then trying to utilize it. You saw that that didn't work. You want something, as you said, aggressive for Gumayushi that he is able to dictate how it's going to go. And especially on the Ziggs, the way that it got set up with a single turret plate. When you look around at what's going on for the other Zig picks, that is a measly, measly bit of gold in the pocket for that one. No wonder we didn't have the damage difference. Well, now we'll see D-plus T1, who can bounce back better from the tilt of getting 3-0 smashed by Gen G Black and Gen G Orange. Speaking of orange, you got to be believing bleeding orange and huffing a whole lot of hopium if you believe that the Weibo Miracle Run continues into the LPL Summer Grand Finals against BLG. This is David and Goliath doesn't even do justice just how big of underdogs Weibo is in this series. It feels like Weibo Gaming is that pristine, enlightened monk walking over the hardened coals and sharp glass. Nothing under this tumultuous journey is going to break their serenity to ultimately achieve and arrive at the finals and their opponent is the ultra relaxed overfed blg the kings just sitting on top of the throne i can't wait for this clash just, in the LPL. they're just lying on spikes that are infused in fire and not even <laughs> flinching like damn i thought we were zen look at these guys but you know you look across this matchup and you're going okay Bin and Breathe, both most played Arbonectin. Bit of a snoozer, top lane matchup. Now we know Bin can pull some stuff out and take things over. 80 carries, Zhao, who's amazing on these picks. He's been excelling in this playoff. Oh, Knight just had one of the best Corky series anyone in the world has had this year, so that maybe cancels out. Both 80 carries play a pretty good Ziggs off meta picks, but uh, Elk is probably a little bit better at it. Both supports have great engages, but both can int a little bit, and Crisp usually ints a whole lot more than on. So the one angle I'm looking at is number one. Laning phase huge edge to BLG. Let's get some lane swaps. Let's try and avoid some of that for Weibo. And number two is the man who has turned the whole season around. It is Tarzan. Most MVPs in the regular season. Most MVPs in the playoffs in the LPL. Can he cook something up? Because Wei has been playing more supportive tank junglers in this BLG squad. Tarzan, seven different champions in playoffs. He's got to do something. Tarzan, to me, has to be that X factor in the series for Weibo Gaming. We've seen him be a complete zilch, zero factor 
for Weibo before early in the season, and we have clearly seen when he is him. He is the guy in the jungle making it all happen for this Weibo squad. The other thing is going to be, of course, as, as you talked about earlier, you got an incredible guy in Knight on the other side in the mid lane up against what has been the other driving force, the fuel for the engine that is uh, Tarzan and what he's been able to do and really accelerate the team is the backbone. Shaohu in the mid lane on these ADCs, things like Lucian. It's gonna be a tough task running that into Knight in the mid lane if Tarzan is not in his game, in his element and making things happen for Weibo Gaming. And we, you know, it goes even deeper, harder for Weibo. We just finished praising Hanwha Life for having incredible team fighting against T1. How many times in this last set against Weibo did BLG have guys surviving with sub 100 health and then the buddy comes in to save him and then somebody else comes in to save him? The team fighting out of BLG and they're opting into team fights every single time has been arguably the best in the world, even better than Gen G. And that's where then I want to return to the top lane of this matchup and talk about Bin and what he's going to do in this series because you talk about maybe the Renekton being, you know, a boring gameplay. Sure, maybe we don't want to pan the camera too much over pre-15 minutes towards the top lane. Outside of that, make sure you're identifying where Bin is, what he is positioning, and how he goes around the fight. I think nobody finds the flank angle better right now than someone like Bin and is more lethal on those engages when he's able to find them a key part of what gets this BLG team to the top level that they're at right now in the LPL. I, I These team fights are going to have to be something else to top the notch that we are seeing currently in the LCK with Gen G and Hanwha Life showing that type of power. I think both of these teams are incentivized to show that for the LPL, whether that is the upstarts in Weibo Gaming getting the upset against the destined kings in BLG. And listen, a guy like Bin, nobody embodies the the brighter the lights, the better they play than Bin. This is a guy who coasts through the regular season more often than not. You get to playoffs or an international event and he revs things up, which makes it... I, I can't possibly see an angle where Weibo wins this series. I'm hard pressed to even see them winning a game. It, it's, it's, that's how impressive a squad like BLG is. I've got enough faith that it's not going to go the way of the LCK, that we at least see some pushback in this series that we do get. Maybe even it's not just pushback from Weibo Gaming. Maybe it is a, a rare blip, a slip in, in the path for BLG in this series as well, where you do get that win for Weibo. I got this one going at least four. I, I hope that's the case. And I... I honestly hope Weibo gets a miracle run through because, number one, that means top esports has to go into the gauntlet if Weibo somehow manages to win this and BLG is then going as that second seed. Imagine BLG as a second seed. Oh, for God. BLG. That's no, maybe not no, a state I want to live in. Don't, don't let us have that as a possibility. That is not fair to anybody either the one seeds or the three and four seats for a group that uh, situation at worlds don't want to see that one this series should live up to it I've, I've got a feeling of it i know there's that angle of oh maybe it's just going to be a fraud performance from weibo gaming i'm going against that i'm taking the angle that we are seeing and entertaining finals in the lp uh, well, it's going to be entertaining, even if it's a stomp. Case in point, that game three in the last of their matchups that was uh, a bloodthirsty one, to say the least. LCS announcing the rookie of the year today. Probably by the time uh, this might get uploaded, it might be announced. But it's either Masu, Sniper, or Thanatos. And this seems cut and dry to me. Thanatos has only played one split. He's been great, but this is like kind of for the full year. And Sniper has kind of trailed off a little bit, whereas Masu maybe started a little bit slow, has leveled up. Masu is the clear front runner to win this. It has to be Masu. There's no other way I see this slicing it up in the LCS. Maybe if Thanatos came over and was completely, you know, transcendental for C9, really, uh, you know, blew out the water how we thought top lane was going to be played in North America and everything else. Uh, that could be the angle that you could go for that short amount of a stay and, and you know, impressiveness. 
over the improvements that we have continued to see from Masu. That's where I want to start to focus on because what we saw from him in the spring split was certainly a little bit tentative, a little bit of behind the speed of where he needed to be at the optimal level for FlyQuest to find success. And that level it isn't super high or super much of a demanding one, but it has to be there at a certain point if you're going to be a championship caliber team in this type of point and that is where he has delivered for FlyQuest the improvements from a lot of tough lessons at MSI I don't think as strong or as big a gains or as notable maybe as players like APA and Yon that we've been spoiled with recently with Team Liquid but absolutely guaranteed gains that we have seen from him in the bottom lane for this FlyQuest team and the confidence that I think that we are seeing to grow from him is another factor that I want to think uh, has really played into the success that we've seen in the second half of Summer Split. The point for all three of these guys is the future is bright for young talent in the LCS, and I know Thanatos is from the LCK. You can't call him NA talent, but specifically, even if you zero in on Masu and Sniper, the mentality that both of these guys have about playing the game, you've heard Masu talk about, they got smacked at MSI. They got beat up and beat down. They did in scrims too, and he said he learned so much in that moment uh, and throughout that event learned way more than when he was playing domestically and even sniper he's had already some ups and downs some hills and valleys but the way these guys talk about improving and focus only on themselves are never never blaming anybody else it's always what they can do better and improve and to have that mentality as a rookie kudos to both of them it's saying about the the individual horse this is about the full stable of the lcs at this point when you're talking about the quality of rookies that are coming through and continuing to be invested in and moving on and becoming key parts of this league general sniper masu certainly players that you can add to that category and feel confident about from this first split Rowan Thanatos, yes, we know, LC, LCK challenger player coming on over and, and helping us out, but Thanatos might have come and inspired Impact to have his best split ever. So we'll give him a thumbs up for that as well, the young guy coming in. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. Thanks for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.